a burden where they add rules and regulations to it. So even if you did something good uh, on, it, because of the law, it was considered bad. And so Jesus healed somebody on that day, uh, and it was a Sabbath day, and because they were sticklers of the law, they said Jesus did something wrong. And so Jesus addressed this issue in verse 17. He addressed this issue of them and with their rules and regulations. It says in 16, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Why? Because he didn't do anything wrong. He was just healing folks. Uh, how many people, if you were sick on the Sabbath, and God came in to heal you, how many people would allow him to heal you? Amen. I, I'd have to do it with the punishment. There's no telling. He might not come back. He's walking this earth. He's able to, to, to restore the limbs. And so if he's asking me to get my limb restored on a day that people consider holy, <laughs> how many people know that I would take the penalty to be restored immediately? Okay, so um, they took the original laws and, and made them uh, and caused burdens for them. And so here's what Jesus says in his defense. He said, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he uh, breaking the Sabbath, but he even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, here's what you have to understand. The fact that he said, my father was the first problem. The fact that he said uh, that that's a typical prayer uh, that the Jews were involved with. If you remember anything about the Old Testament ways and Old Testament laws and stuff like that, uh, well, let's think about the prayer that Jesus gave. What did they say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, come on, y'all can say it, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he would use our Father. That's a general prayer. That's generalizing everything. That's everybody coming together and saying, our Father. Now Jesus comes forward and says, my Father. So now it becomes a little bit personal. And they're looking at him like, who are you to say, my Father? Well, if I'm born on this earth and, and, and I have a Father who is a human, that makes me human also. If I'm some form of, a, <clears throat> of an animal, that makes me an animal. However, if I am God and I say my, and, 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 and as uh, his son, I say my father, that makes me equivalent to God. That makes me just a part of the same DNA. That makes me, if he's God, I'm God also. So here's the, the, uh, the interesting stuff about this. Jesus became more personal by saying, my father, and it established something. The leaders looked at him and thought he, um, you know, he was trying to act like he was God. Well, you're either, uh, you, you don't try to act like God, you either are God or you're not God. And what you find out with Jesus is that he was God. And so, Jesus establishes himself as the father's son by saying, my father. And you're thinking about these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these people of the Jewish council. They're sitting here saying, oh, that is blasphemy. I can't believe this man has the nerve to say these things. We need to get him out of here before people start following him. Well, he already had thousands of people following him. And so this man, by the way, his name is Jesus. He's performing miracles. Not only is he performing miracles, but because he's performing miracles, he claims to be God. Wait, now, was he not the one who said, or was he not wrong when he said that the Father is always working? Think about it. The Father is always working, even on the day of rest. Why? Because if the Father stopped working, this world would shut down. If the father stopped working, the son would not stay in the same place. 
If the, if the Father stopped working, the moon wouldn't stay in the same place. The earth would not stay in the same place. The very work of God sustains everything that we have, everything that we're a part of. So if the Father, so that's why Jesus is saying, my Father is always working um, from this very day, and I too am working. Now, <clears throat> verse 18, he says, for this reason they try to kill him. I mean, it says, for this reason they try to kill him all the more. Uh, for breaking, not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Now, so Jesus confirms all of their thoughts, because you think about this man coming in and saying, uh, he's, not, he's not implying anything, he's actually saying, this is my father. If that's my father, guess what? That makes me his son. And if I'm his son, that makes me equivalent. And if I'm equivalent, that makes me God. And if I'm God, that makes me your, 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 my servants. That means you answer to me. You look at me. I am God. I am the deal. I am the reason you exist. And he's telling them that. See, Jesus can do all things but lie. So when they ask him questions, he's not going to lie to them. He may deceive them and tell them things that are not that so that they don't understand it under the spirit. But when they act, when he says something, when they say something about who he is, he has to tell them, tell them who he is. And he tells them, my father is always at work. Now, in verse 19, Jesus gave them the answer they were asking. He says, very uh, truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. Wow. Whatever this father does, the son does also. Now, I want you to write this down. It is impossible for Jesus to respond contrary to his father. It's impossible for Jesus to respond contrary to his father. Why? Because they are one. God is God. There is not one God. There's not two gods or three gods or four gods. They are considered God. There's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they are considered one. So what does that mean? He cannot do anything contrary to what the Father has sent him to do. If you understood, you know that Jesus did the Father's will, and the Father was always pleased with his response. <clears throat> That's like me saying, I'm pleased with the way my, my body responded to what my mind told it to do. My mind is, my mind controls my body. My brain tells my body how to respond, and my body responds. And for me to be pleased with that, I expect that. Why? Because we are of the same nature. So it is with Christ. Christ and the Father are one. The Father is pleased with how the, father, how the Son responds. Why? Because they are of the same nature. One can't respond different from the other. They're always in agreement. Okay, so verse 20 says this. Verse 20 says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. And it says, Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. I need you to understand this. When the Lord came to this earth, he was still a deity, meaning he was still God. When he came to this earth, he submitted as a man, yet a deity, to the Father. Meaning he was God on this earth and yet a man, but he submitted to the Father's way because right at that moment he was not being God. He was being submiss uh, submissive to his Father. He was following his Father's rules. He was following his Father's guidelines. He came to serve a life to please the Father, not to please anybody else. So he laid down his part of being God and said, I am going to serve this man. 
Now, that's some things we need to learn in our lives, how to lay down our parts of trying to be God in our lives and give God the glory for who he is. Let him be the first. Let him be the last. Let him be everything in our lives. So I want to continue on with this. When the Lord, who was a deity, came to earth, he submitted to, to the Father. And if you understood it, what Jesus said every time he came here, he said, I came to do the will of the one who sent me. I came to do the will of my Father, whatever my Father says. If it's my Father's will, remember before he died, before he gave his life, he talked to the Father. And even in his feelings as a man, he said, Father, if there is another way to do this, if there is another way for me to get through this, if there's another way, if you can take away this cup of suffering, then do so. But then he said on the other end, but thy will be done. Yeah. Meaning, I know I want to do it this way, but whatever God says, let it be so. Why? Because he's trying to live a life like you. So that when you have trials, when you have tribulation, you can reach up to God and say, God, I know that I want to do it my own way, but thy will be done. And then he will listen to you. And so the Jews believed that God, only God had the power to raise the dead. If you understand the Old Testament ways in Genesis, the Jews believed that only God had that power. He could do it at will whenever he wanted. He gave life. And so if, he, if he's the only one who had the power to raise the dead, then verse 21 is going to make some folks mad. And, <laughs> and you got to picture the Jewish, San, I mean the San Eden, you got to picture these folks. They're looking at Jesus as them thinking they are the deal because they have the, gall, the, the laws of Moses who, and they don't realize that they're in front of the guy, the God who gave them the laws of Moses. And so they're, they're sitting in front of him trying to find fault in what he's doing. And so verse 21, <clears throat> if, if they know automatically that God is the only one who has the power to raise the dead, then Jesus, what Jesus says, offends them. Because he says, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives it life to whom he is pleased to give it. <laughs> this is not just referring to physical death. And so you have to understand that. Jesus is talking about giving life, period. Whether it be uh, eternal life, whether it be physical death or physical life, he is the one who is saying that he gives life. And so, so not only is Jesus claiming to be equal to God, not only is he claiming to have the power to raise the dead, but he's also claiming to have, uh, let's read verse 22, he says, um, I'm going to go back to 21 for you. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Verse 22, let's read this. He says, more ever the, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. <laughs> so now you have a man who's standing in front of you saying that he's equal to God. Why? Because he's of God. Yes. And he's also claiming to have power of life and death. And he's also claiming to have judgment in his hands, which means that all of these people, according to the laws, if you, know, if you understand anything according to the laws, God was the ultimate judge. That nobody else could judge. God was the one you had to sit before. If you read the Old Testament laws, the Mosaic laws, there that everything was based on God. Honor God, give glory to God. And now you have a man in front of you saying that he is equal to God, claiming to have power to raise the dead, and claiming to have all judgment in his hands. And so nobody dared to assume otherwise 
that God, uh, than God having the power. And so they're looking at this physical man, this man who bleeds like they bleed, this man who sleeps like they sleep, who eats food like they eat food, who washes himself like they wash themselves. And he's sitting in front of them saying, not only am I equal to God, but I have the power to raise the dead. I have the power to give life. And then he's saying, you'll be before me when you die. Why? Because all judgment is mine. And then he's saying, uh, I, uh, I am the one. And he's saying that he's equal and equivalent to everything that God is. And can you imagine these people looking at him and saying, look at this crazy man. However, this was the same man who just healed a man and restored him and gave him back his, his not the abilities that he had never had. And now this man is before them and he's telling them what he has done and who he is. And so here's the problem. Nobody dared to do that. Nobody dared to, to tell these Sanhedrin that they were the deal. Nobody dared to claim to be God. However, nobody had the ability to heal like Jesus did. The only reason that God gave, the Father gave him the ability to heal was so that when people looked at him, they would know that he was God. Why? Because he had abilities to do things that nobody else had the ability to do. And so, uh, now you can imagine the saying, he's looking at this man thinking he's out of control. This man's out of control. He has the nerve to come before us, and we are the Jewish council, and tell us that he is the deal. He has the nerve to come before us and tell us that he will be judging us. He has the nerve to come before us and tell us that he is the one who, who um, uh, is, is equal to God. And so it, get work. it gets worse. Because if you are a Jewish leader, it's already bad. You're already mad at this man. You're already hostile. Can you imagine that you've been following these laws all of your life? And then a man comes out of nowhere, and this man comes out of nowhere and tells you all of this stuff. Can you imagine how you would feel as a Sanhedrin, as a person following what you thought was God? Well, uh, it gets out of control here in verse 23. Because verse 23, he says, All judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. This next sentence is crucial. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. What does that mean? Oh, I'm a Sanhedrin. I've been following God all of my lives. I've been following all of the procedures. I've been following all the laws, all the rules. My father's father followed the rules. My, my father's father's father followed the rules. We have grown up following the Mosaic laws. We live by it. We die by it. We give our tithes. We give all of our money to God. We, we put God first. He is our first and foremost. And then this man comes before me and says that if I do not honor him, I've never honored God. Wow. All that I've been doing is nothing. My whole life is nothing if I do not recognize you. My, my family, my generations that have been following what we call the Mosaic Laws, now I, there's a man in front of me who just, by the way, healed somebody. And they're telling this man is telling me, it's great that you have all of this. It's great about your history. However, if you do not know the Son, you do not know the Father, because the Son and the Father are the same. Oh, buddy, you have made me mad. As a Sanhedrin, I am mad. You're telling me my whole life is false if I do not know you. You're telling me that you're God? How are you God? Why are you not floating and healing people that way? Why are you not coming down as, as 10 feet tall and doing all these things. You're coming down. You're a man just like me. We can fight right now. But Jesus says, whoever does not honor me does not honor 
the Father. So now you have them thinking that he is crazy. The nerves of this guy. He thinks he is the Son of God. It's, there's no questions about it. There's no whether he is or whether he isn't. He thinks he is the Son of God. There's no, uh, um, well maybe he feels wrong, maybe he's disoriented. He thinks he is the Son of God. They, they can't uh, question him anymore and say, well maybe you need to ask him different questions. No, he thinks he is the Son of God. So verse 24, he said, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words, and believe in him who sent me as eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life there's a couple of things you need to look at here um, it says whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged um, has eternal life first of all it doesn't say will have eternal life it doesn't say may have eternal life. It says has eternal life, which means that if we're fast forwarding to what we do right now, in fact, the moment that you believed in Jesus Christ, the moment that you accepted him and realized that what he has done is the truth, not have, not will have, but you already have eternal life. What does that mean? It means that from that moment forward, God, you realize that God has chosen you. He has selected you. He knew that you were going to do the work that you've done. He knew that you were going to go where you've been. He knew all the bad things you were going to do. Some of us convict ourselves of the things we've done wrong. We're going to get an amen this morning. Amen. Some of us convict ourselves of things that we've done in the past and wish that we could have done it differently. Some of us wish we could have went back and changed everything. Uh, how many people have said before, if I could go back? How many people have said that? If I could go back, I would do things. Look, all of us say that. If I could go back, man, I would just change. Some of y'all said I would change the person I'm with. Some of y'all say, don't raise your hands on that one. Some of y'all said I would change the job. I would make better decisions. I would do all those things. But God has planned you for a reason. He had a purpose in you. And that purpose is far bigger than anything you could achieve or anything you have done in your life. And you've got to know that he, once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have to realize that it was pre-planned. It wasn't because you decided to follow God. It was because God had a plan for you that was before the beginning of time. That, that, that what Ephesians 4 says, Ephesians 1, 4 says, He chose us and Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. What does that mean? Once you accept God and you believe it, you were part of His plan. You were part of His plan since the very beginning of time. I know you said, I've done some bad things. Well, God knew you were going to do some bad things. It says, we're sin about, grace abounds all the more. What does that mean? Your sins, God has already extended the grace around it. He already knew what you were going to do wrong. He knew the things you were going to say bad. He knew all those things. And so, let's continue on with this. And so it says, uh, verse 24, it says that uh, whoever hears the word and believes has eternal life and will not be judged. Be judged by who? by Jesus because he just told them he was the judge. He just told them he has the authority to judge folks and he will be the one who judges folks. And so uh, verse 25, let's read verse 25. Verse 25 he says, <clears throat> very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Wow. I need you to understand something. Um, the first question you've got to ask yourself is why do they hear? If an undertaker, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a perfect picture of this situation. If an undertaker takes a dead body and dresses it up to look immaculate, 
good? Uh, does it change the outcome of the body? No, why? Because the body is dead. Yes. If he puts perfume on the body, and the body smells and looks good, does it make a difference? No, why? Because the body is dead. If he calls out to the body, since he doctored the body up, and the body looks perfect like it should be a lot, and he says, hey, how do you think you look? What is the body going to say? Absolutely nothing. Why? Because the body is dead. The body is incapable of responding to what the undertaker has done to the body. What does that mean? No matter how great you look, no matter how much makeup you have, no matter how great you look on the outside, no matter how much cologne you put on, before you knew Jesus Christ, you were dead which means you were incapable of responding to God. Incapable. There was no way you could respond to God unless what happens? Unless you be made alive. And the only way to be made alive, it's a work that's not done by you. You can't make yourself alive. It is impossible to make yourself alive. And, and so people say, well, I accepted Jesus. You didn't accept Jesus because you wanted to, because as dead, as a dead person, it's incap you're incapable of responding to life. So, if you're incapable of responding to life, you're incapable of responding to God. So how do you hear? How do you hear the word of God? How did you decide to follow God? Because God made you alive. He's the one who did the work. He's the one who changed you. He's the one who shifted you on the inside. He's the one who allowed you to show up here. He's the one who woke you up. He's the one who woke you up and you said, man, I feel like going to church. Anybody ever had that before? When you woke up and said, man, I, I didn't feel like it before, but I need to find me a church home. I, I, I know I've been going through all this stuff. I need, to, I need to give my life or find God. I need to do this. Well, the reason that happens is not because of any work that you have done. It's because of all the works that God has done. He took you as a dead person who was dead to sin and he made you alive. Why? So that you could respond to his son. John 6.43 says, John 6.43 says that nobody can come to the son unless the father draws him. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, he said, nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Now, so what does that mean? It means that when you make a decision to know God, it's because God made a decision to know you. Isn't that awesome? Look, look we look at kings. We, we hope to meet Obama someday and say, hey, Obama, you're awesome. Thank you for being our president. We, if we meet kings who, who, who have jewelry and all this other stuff and have authority, it's an honor to meet them. But the God of heaven and earth, the God of this galaxy, chose you. Not only chose you, but he made you alive. He made you alive. Why? Not just for him, but so that you may reach out to his son when the works of his son comes forward. So why is that exciting? Let's read verse 26. Verse 26 says, for as the Father has, eternal, has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And it says, he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man, meaning he is the Son of God, meaning that he is man on this earth, but he is also God in the flesh. So, now, let's continue on. It says, verse 28, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. So what does that mean? Jesus is just establishing his authority clearly for us to know. And 
um, what is he saying he is? Let's, let's continue on. It says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus is establishing his authority clear here in this chapter. He is allowing you to understand that he is the incarnate word who became flesh. He is the son of God. He does the will of the Father who sent him. He does not operate on his own. He operates uh, to fulfill the will of the Father. He has the power of life and death, and, which is eternal life and death in his hands. All judgment will be controlled by him. Those who were dead due to sin, who were incapable of responding to life, which is all of us, everybody raise your hand in here, which is all of us in here, were given life by God the Father, in order to respond to the good news about the Son, Jesus Christ, which means the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the one who keeps your heart beating, has chosen you to know him. That is a hallelujah in itself. It means that he selected you, preordained you to reach out to his son. Why? Because he had a miraculous uh, uh, change that he wanted to do in you. He wanted to show you that it was impossible, impossible for you to know his son unless he wanted you to know his son. I don't think we get it sometimes. I think we miss out on, 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 on what God is to us. And not only does he enable us to respond to the good news about Jesus Christ. What we have to do as Christians is take advantage of the privilege that he has allowed you to be with. Yeah, my voice may be challenged today, but there was a privilege in this room. Yeah, I may have some challenges in my life, but there was a privilege in this room. Yeah, you have challenges in your life, but there was a privilege in this room, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has not only chosen you, but has given you a privilege, not the privilege just to see him do his miracle, but the privilege to believe in him. Because it takes the Father saying, this one is special for you to know God. Amen. So you have to take advantage of the privilege given to you in knowing the Son's authority. Because not all have been given that privilege. It's an honor to be up here to speak to people about Jesus Christ. I don't worry about what I'm going through. Because it's an honor. And so the privilege, sometimes we take for granted, granted the grace that has been applied to our lives. Sometimes we take for granted the blessings that God has given us. Sometimes we look for the money and the cars and the great job and the bank accounts and all those other things and winning the lotto and everything else as the privilege, I mean as, as a blessing. When the blessing was the fact that God chose you out of a sinful body, a sinful life, and changed you to receive his son as Lord and Savior. That's it. There's nothing else you need to know. <clears throat> Sometimes we take for granted what has been applied to our lives. Do you realize that you have been pardoned by God? Pardoned, meaning he said this one is guilty and will be punished for their sins. This one is responsible for everything they've done wrong. You're not responsible. You're not responsible. This one is responsible. You're not responsible. You're not. This one is responsible. You're not responsible. You're not responsible. And so you have to know that God selected us and said we will not be responsible for everything we have done wrong in our lives. Now, sometimes we take for granted the grace that has been applied to our lives. Look, it's an honor to come up here with a normal voice and serve God and give y'all an awesome sermon. But it's a privilege to be able to come up here and struggle 
and suffer and do it. Sometimes we take for granted what he has given us. You have to realize you've been pardoned by God. You've been made alive to open up to God. You've been, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. And look, when he looks in his book, your name is here. Your name is there. You say, well, I've done some things wrong. But did you believe in Jesus Christ? You said, I, 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 I may have talked to people wrong and never forgave somebody. But did you believe in Jesus Christ? Or some the other person may say, well, I've been in church all my life. I've done all this stuff. I've been on the usher board. I've been in the praise team. I've done all this stuff. And then, the, then Jesus will look at his book and say, your name is not written here. You, you may have done all that stuff, but you never accepted me. You never knew me. My father never drew you. You never accepted anything. Sometimes we take for granted what God has done for us. The privilege he has given us. You must take this jewel that God has given you and make every opportunity to soak up what's been available to you. You can't get deceived in seeing Jesus as a great public figure. You can't get deceived at seeing him as a prophet because some people say he's a prophet. You can't get deceived at seeing him as a high priest because the word does say he's a high priest, but not just that. You get to see him for who he is. There are people who are getting deceived to see him as a prophet. But you get to see him for who he is. There are people who have been deceived to think that he wasn't God. He was just a man who did miraculous things. But you get to see him as he is. He has taken off all that for you to see him. Sometimes everybody else they try to take you in the wrong direction. But because God has written your name in the Lamb Book of Life, he, he, you cannot be deceived and taken in the wrong direction because he says, nobody can take you out of my hand and nobody can take you out of my Father's hand because we are one and no matter how many things you go through, I will be there for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, which means that you are special. Not only are you special, but you're special to be involved in knowing who Jesus really is. You have to know he is our rock. He cannot be moved. It is impossible to move God from your life. Somebody can get you to think differently, but the Holy Spirit still resides in your body. He is our master. He cannot be defeated. ISIS seems like they can't be defeated. America seems like they can't be defeated. Russia seems like they can't be defeated. But all of these countries, all of these people can be destroyed. But God is saying, I am your master. No matter who takes you out, no matter who tries to cause you problems or cause you harm, I am your master and I cannot be defeated. Amen. He is all powerful. Meaning there are no obstacles that he can't overcome. I didn't think I'd be able to speak this morning, but he's given me what I needed to perform his work. All powerful meaning. There are no obstacles. Whatever obstacle you have in your life, God can defeat that obstacle if it be his will. Yes. He is sovereign, meaning he is supreme authority. We can put our trust in him because he continues to do his work in us. He continues to restore our lives. He continues to renew our lives. Some of you have screamed and cursed at God before. 
Some of you have gotten mad. Has anybody ever screamed at God before? Has anybody ever gotten mad before? Has anybody ever said, God, I don't even know if you're here? How many people have said that before? Well, let me, I want you to keep your hands up because you still showed up to church this morning. Amen. 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 So, sovereign means he's the supreme authority. Meaning, your boss may say one thing. Meaning, your government may say one thing. Meaning, somebody may try to be president who you don't want to be president. But the supreme authority is God. Which means that everything ends and begins with him. Which means that no matter who he puts as your president, you serve God first. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. He does not leave you nor forsake you. No matter what your turmoil is, God is with you. Now, it also says he is eternal. <laughs> he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What does that make him? The first and the last. What does that make him? Even before you knew him, he knew you. What does that make him? Even before your mom knew you were coming, he knew your mom and he knew you were coming. Even if somebody said you were a mistake, he knew you and he purposed you into that person. It also says that he is I am. He's solid. You can trust his word. Look, we may not be able to trust our friends. Have you ever met somebody you couldn't trust any word that came out of their mouth? Amen. Have you ever met somebody who you trusted and then they lied to you? Amen. Have you ever met somebody who you've known for years who's deceived you? Amen. God says, he is I am, which means that his word stands for what it is. Meaning, if he tells you something, it is. It means that if he says he will be there for you, he is. It means that if you're going through the worst problem, he is there with you. It means that if you're thrown in a dungeon, he's right beside you. It means that if you're, you're dealing with the worst circumstance in your life, an ailment, a sickness, or whatever you're dealing with, I am is there with you. Your friends may leave you. Your family may leave you. People may uh, think of you as despicable. You know, when I dealt with the sickness where my hands were, were having challenges and my face was having challenges, the word said that I am is always there with you, which means that even if I look the worst, I have the most who is with me. You have to take this privilege to absorb the knowledge of the son's authority. Not everybody has the abilities that you have. Not everybody has been given the gift that you have. You have God who is with you. He has opened himself up to you and closed himself up to others. What does that mean? When you want to learn about God, you can learn about God. Why? Because your name is written in that book that says he is approved, she is approved, they are approved to know who God is. Amen. You have to take the privilege not to miss what he offers, which are the keys to the kingdom of God. You can read scripture and understand it. Others can read scripture and think of it as nice parables. You have abilities that others have. Others can hear about Jesus and not accept him. You can hear about Jesus and be excited. Why? Because the spirit that is in you is greater than the spirit that is in this world. Amen. Don't miss the opportunities that he has given you to the king, the keys to the kingdom. You have been given eternal life. What does that mean? It means that you have something to hope for. It says to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. Do you know that you don't even die? You pass over. The, the word says it's like a twinkling of an eye. Your eyes close and then they open. It's like that for you. Why? Because you have been blessed. God has chosen you as his child. He has given you the abilities. So how important is this for us? Because some of us take this for granted. Some of us don't read the word like we should. 
Some of us don't study like we should. Some of us think, well, I can miss this Bible study, or I can miss this Bible study, or I'll study tomorrow. When there are people who are dying to have the abilities that you have, do you know, you know, we take advantage of not of being able to eat today. There are people across this world who can't eat. There are people across this world who are dying of starvation. And yet we have the ability to leave here and think about what we're eating. Well, that is major. But how much more major than the eternal life that God has given you? And what do we do with it? We have to take advantage of it. You have to take advantage of the ability to know God. You, you're able to know the Spirit of God. He has revealed himself to you. And so the least we can do is serve him more than we've ever served any other person on this earth. We can seek after his will. You've been given eternal life. You've been given a blessing from God. He has created the earth and said, this person will have me forever. What do you do with that? You serve him all the days of your life. Well, I'm having problems in my relationship, but your relationship, see, I can tell you this, a person who, who experiences this, because we all do, when people have problems in other circumstances, it normally relates to the problems we have with serving God. You cannot serve another man unless you learn to serve God. You cannot serve another woman unless you learn to serve God. You can't be obedient at a job if you haven't been obedient with the Lord. It is impossible. And so if you want to become better at what you do, become better at serving the great I Am. The author and the vision finisher of our faith. The one who was and is and is to come. If we become more stewards, learning, writing down the word, studying it, asking questions, you know what happens to us? We get closer to God. What does that make you obedient to everybody else? It makes you submissive to, to your husband or submissive to your wife or submissive to your children or understanding of your job. Why? Because you know God is the ultimate. You're not worried about positions. Why? Because you know he is the ultimate position. He is provided for you. You know that if you don't have good habits, look at your lives, wherever you're at, whatever problems you have, I can guarantee you it's related to God. If you have a problem believing in what somebody says, it's because you haven't believed in what God has said. So you have to take this privilege to know the son's authority because not everybody was given that. Some are made to have their hearts hardened by Satan. Some are made to not believe by Satan. But Satan has no authority over your lives. Why? Because God has said, this is my child who I love, who I have put in my Lamb's book of life. You can challenge him, but you cannot take his life. Amen. So I'll end with this. As children of God, we have got to know the Son's authority. It is your duty to learn it. I may not be here another day. You may not be here another day. But the Word of God never ends. It means that you have to seek ye first the kingdom of God. First, not after you're trying to figure out why your relationship is going bad. Not, not after you're trying to figure out why your job is bad. First, if you put him first, he'll never put you second. And so this, the, the enemy hates us talking about this. Why? Because if you get it, you defeat him. The word says, you defeat the enemy by resisting him. How do you resist him? Resist him by accepting God. Everything is of God. God, what do you want me to have? Do you want this job? Let it be your will. I'll go to the interview freely. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you want me to do, I do. I know my bills are due, but you already knew before me that I would have these problems. God, I know my family is hungry, but you have already provided for me. You already know what I need, and so I'm going to give it all to you. Lay it at your feet. Take all the fear away from me and allow me to serve you. If you've been blessed, I need you to stand and give God glory in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen.
Thank <laughs> you.